I'm glad so many of you could join tonight. I know that you know the university has extended their closing until tomorrow afternoon because of all the icing and everything. It's <clears throat> for those of you that live in the north, it must seem uh, a little silly for Alabama to declare a state of emergency and schools close and everything. But people down here do not know how to drive on ice and uh, uh, we don't have snow plow or well, not you know, we have snow plows but we don't have salt trucks or even sand trucks so you know Teresa Louisiana either so there's been you know quite a an, we've got a lot of bridges here because so much of us uh, you know so much of the land is at sea level so a lot of the interstates are raised so it's been a real mess so Anyway, I'm glad you could join me, and tonight we're going to talk about contraceptive methods. Uh, this is, you know, something that you will do a lot in your women's health um, clinical, either this semester or in the fall if you're doing it then. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you are getting to do clinical, <coughs> excuse me, at a health department. Uh, those are, and if you have a choice and can get clinical at a health department, those are excellent places for GYN clinical because you usually do lots and lots of contraceptive management and lots of pap smears. So, and a lot of STD screenings. So you get a lot of uh, experience that sometimes you don't get those in a private office. So um, it is important to become familiar with the different methods of contraception so that you can educate your patients because, you know, they might come in and all they know about is the pill and, you know, they don't really know, you know, what the other methods are or whether, you know, one of those methods would be better for them. So let's get started. This <clears throat> slide is from 2011. I don't think they've um, updated it since then. 6.7 million pregnancies over one year and of those, um, 51% are intended and 49% are unintended. <clears throat> that does not mean not want it, but they were not trying to get pregnant. So a lot of those are going to be um, you know, patients that didn't want to, did not want to get pregnant. Uh, of those 5% fetal losses, 21% elective terminations, and 23% uh, unintended or unplanned births. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm, I don't have a cold or anything, but I've got a scrappy throat. So I worked, I usually work two to three days a month in the ER. I worked three days this week because of the flu. All the, <clears throat> everybody is slammed. So this is just a slide comparing different effectiveness of different plan, family planning methods uh, on the bottom from the least effective to the most effective at the top. Um, at the bottom, obviously, withdrawal and then sperm sides used alone without barriers. About 30 pregnancies per 100 women uh, per year. Uh, then the barrier methods are next uh, with condoms, diaphragms, female condoms, fertility awareness, um, like the, the um, billings method and different things like that. We'll talk about those. And then uh, uh, next is the injectables like Depo, uh, lactational amenorrhea method, uh, oral contraceptive pills, patch, and vaginal ring. And then the most effective with less than one pregnancy per 100 women per year <clears throat> is the contraceptive implant, any of the IUDs, and sterilization, both male and female. <clears throat> you do not need to know these statistics. It's just for your information. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, these are just the rates of unintended pregnancies uh, in the first year of contraceptive use. You use nothing, you know, 85 pregnancies per 100 women uh, if they're not using any contraception. Um, the pill, patch, and ring, about nine pregnancies per uh, 100 nuts in the first year. And a lot of those are just due to um, you know, they're not taking them correctly, they miss the pill, they skip, things like that. And you'd think, well, how can, you know, the injection have this many? Well, people don't always come back at uh, the proper intervals at 12 weeks to get the, the injection again. They sometimes go four months and five months. So there are different things. Okay, consider 
considerations when deciding on a contraceptive method. These are just some things you want to go over with the client and questions that you want to ask yourself as you're taking the history. Does the patient want short-term or long-term contraception? If she's 15 years old, hopefully she wants long-term contraception. Um, maybe she's 32 years old and has had two or three children and, and thinks that her family may be complete. So she, but she doesn't want, you know, sterilization or anything. So she wants longer term contraception. Or is it, you know, somebody that just got married and is planning maybe to start a family in a year, so they want something more short term. What are their comorbidities? It's really, really important to take a, a good health history um, before you prescribe any of the contraceptive methods. Do they have diabetes, coronary artery disease, hypertension, liver disease, sickle cell disease? Uh, have they had cancer of any kind? Do they have a history of blood clots or any thrombosis? Um, do they have systemic lupus? And if so, is it, is it um, controlled or is it active? Uh, are they smokers? Do they have heavy periods, amenorrhea or you know, no period? Menorrhagia or very heavy, frequent, irregular periods? Do they have acne? Some of these things can be made better by using a certain, you know, certain method. And what is their history of PID or their risks for PID? You know, do they have a lot of, um, well, we'll talk about that down here. And <clears throat> does the client want a contraception that just is used at the time of intercourse? Do they want to have something that they use daily, weekly, or longer term? Can they remember to take a pill every day? I mean, I could not remember to take a pill every day. And, Unfortunately, I was not very fertile, so I, had, I went the other way and had to go to a fertility specialist. But um, I'm still terrible. When I was on uh, X a long, long time ago, they used to the osteoporosis, um, Fosamax was every day, and I just missed so much of it because I cannot remember to take a pill every day. So, um, you know, talk about that. Uh, this is especially important with teenagers that are trying to hide it from their parents. You know, if they have to hide their pills under the bed, are they going to remember to take them? Uh, do they want something, you know, maybe they're in a relation, in and out of relationships. Maybe they um, don't have frequent intercourse, so they don't want something every day. They just want something for the occasional time that they're going to have intercourse. Or do they want something long-term that they're not going to have to worry about, like an IUD? Is the client at high risk for STDs? Always encourage condom use regardless of contraceptive methods, especially with um, you know, single patients or patients that are not in monogamous relationships um, because you know, uh, none of the other methods um, except for condoms protect against STDs. So make sure they know, you know, yes, the pill may keep them from getting pregnant, but it's not going to keep them from getting herpes. So encourage uh, uh, condom use with all contraceptives. But ask them, you know, how many partners in the past three months, how many partners in the last year, you know, are they in a monogamous relationship? Do they have casual sex? Do they always use a barrier method? Um, because the risk of STD may help you decide whether or not they are eligible for IUD. And I just touched on this a little bit. If they're a teen, does the parent know that the teen is using contraception? It's much easier if the teen can be open about it. And uh, you know, I usually tell them, put the pack of pills by your toothbrush. That's something you do at the same time every day. When you get up in the morning, take your pill. If you have to hide it in your book bag, you're more likely to forget it. Um, but you know, there are times when teens are not, do not have the relationship with the parent um, that you would hope they would and are not open with them, so they do have to hide it. And then cost is a factor and access to care. If they choose a method where they have to come back periodically, like depot is every three months, or the pill they have to get, you know, refilled every six months or, or sometimes uh, doctors will go a year. It just, and uh, then, obviously, how good their access to care is can make a difference. Uh, this is a slide that you can go back and look at. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It talks about hormonal <clears throat> contraception. This is the normal hormone levels, the LH and the FSH. You have the FSH going along, and then in the middle cycle, you have a little bit of a 
an elevation of that, um, and this is the LH or luteinizing hormone, and you get a large surge of that, and that's what causes ovulation. So um, that is without anything, and here's the follicle developing, ovulating, and then disintegrating. And then when you're on um, a, a combination oral contraceptive pills, the FSH and LH levels are flatter. So you don't get the development of a follicle, so you don't get ovulation. Okay, so let's <clears throat> talk about types of hormonal contraceptions, and it's going to be most of the contraception except for the, um, the copper IUD and condoms. So you have, and some of these, you know, I, I do want you to know these abbreviations because you may see them on the test. I don't write out, you know, combination oral contraceptive pills on every question. So a combination oral contraceptive pill, COC, that contains estrogen and progesterone. That's probably the most, you know, common type of oral contraceptive pill. Uh, then there are progesterone-only products. You can have pills, oral contraceptive pills. We call these POP, progesterone-only pills. That's like um, Micronor and other things that are used a lot of times for people that have contraindications to estrogen or are breastfeeding. Then you have Depo-Provera injection, <clears throat> uh, which is an injection of progesterone that's given every three months. You have the IUD um, which has levonorgestrel and the, the several of them, Marina, Skyla, Kylina, and Loletta. Um, I will say the levonorgestrel IUD on the test, so you don't have to know all of these brands, but um, if I give you a brand, it would probably be Marina, uh, just because it's um, you know, the, the oldest one. And then you have the progesterone implant, which is called Nexplanon. It used to be called Implanon, so you might get some patients that say they had an Implanon. And this is the um, implant that goes in the upper arm uh, for three years. Um, another type of uh, delivery system is the vaginal ring. It's called NuvaRing. Uh, you should know that name because it's the only one. <laughs> um, and it is an estrogen and progesterone, so it's a combination method. Uh, that's inserted in the vagina, and it secretes the um, hormones. And then you have the transdermal patch, which goes on kind of like a Band-Aid. Um, and this is an, another combination, estrogen, progesterone, orthoever is the most common of that one, and Zulane is another one. So let's first talk um, um, Danielle, we'll talk about the antibiotics in a little bit. Um, Danielle's asking about interference with um, contraceptives if you take antibiotics. That usually is just oral contraceptives because it's the GI tract. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, combination oral contraceptives, or COCs, these are um, another, you know, we say OCPs, that's oral contraceptive pills, but that can be progesterone or estrogen progesterone. So these are the combination ones we're going to talk about. These pills contain a combination of estrogen and progesterone. The formulations include monthly and extended use packs that go up for a year, uh, as long as a year. The mechanism of action is to inhibit ovulation and the, make the cervical mucus thicker so that it's less um, hospitable to sperm you know, traveling up the vagina. Uh, the efficacy, about 3% failure rate, and that, um, you know, a lot of it is use, uh, whether they're using it correctly. Minor common side effects are breast tenderness, nausea, headache, breakthrough bleeding, or changes in the menses. And most of these are going to resolve over the first several months of use. So as long as you tell patients, you know, especially teenagers that are just starting, tell them to expect these things and tell them some of the things they can do. Like if they have nausea, they can take it at night before they go to bed instead of in the morning. And then the highest levels of, of estrogen and progesterone are, are secreted at night and they kind of sleep through the nausea. Um, the breakthrough bleeding, that's probably the one that makes them come in the most and say, oh, I just stop these because it's making me bleed all the time and I never know when my period's going to be. If you can tell them this is to be expected, it should get better. 
their periods are going to probably get lighter and more regular as they go on. Um, so as long as they know, a lot of times they can handle the side effects. So here are some advantages, and I do want you to know these. Combination. Okay. Uh, I can you hear me now? Okay. Don't know what that was. Just lost connectivity. So it looks like it's still recording. So we'll just keep on going. So advantages of oral con combination oral contraceptives is decrease in menorrhagia. So if you have someone who you know doesn't even necessarily Okay, I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know why that's doing that. My internet, it doesn't look like my internet is going out or anything. So, oh.
Can you hear me now? Can hear me. Great. Okay, I'm just going to use the the um cell phone then. Let me plug this in before my computer dies. Okay, the joys of technology. So I guess I get to sit on the floor and do this. So you can he hear me, see me, and see the presentation now? Great, okay, let's start back. Okay, so uh, get back to the advantages of combination oral contraceptives, decreased menstrual bleeding, so decreased menorrhagia, decrease in acne. A lot of teenagers are put on oral contraceptive pills solely for the source, uh, for the uh, use of decreasing their acne, you know, with severe acne. Decrease in polycystic ovarian syndrome. Decrease ovarian cysts. My daughter had uh, two ovarian cysts when she was 16, uh, about six months apart, and uh, ended up having to go on birth control pills because both of them were on the right. So you have to do a whole workup to make sure they don't have appendicitis. <laughs> and it was because she was having anovulatory cycles. So they put them on uh, oral contraceptives to uh, decrease those ovarian cysts. Uh, decrease incidence of PID. Again, that uh, cervical mucus is, is thicker. So that provides some barrier to infection getting up into the upper uh, re reproductive tract. A decrease in both ovarian and endometrium cancer, decrease in benign breast disease like fibrocystic breast uh, disease, a, a decrease in ectopic pregnancies, and an increase in bone density. Some of the contraindications, and these are very important, smokers over age 35. And I don't care, you know, some of them say they smoke less than five cigarettes a day or something like that, you know. <laughs> People never tell the truth about how much they smoke. So if they smoke, I would you know, say no, con no um, combination oral contraceptives after age 35. A history of any kind of DVT, MI, stroke, any thrombolytic event, because estrogen does increase the risk of blood clots. A history, of, a history or current breast cancer, because that can be stimulated by estrogens. Uncontrolled hypertension or diabetes. Now, if they do have you know, good control, then they can use them, but it has to be controlled. Prolonged uh, immobilization. Again, this is because of blood clots. You can get, develop a DVT. So if they um, you know, break a leg and are gonna be in a cast and not able to you know, get up for a while, then they probably need to go off the pill. Triglycerides of greater than 250. Active liver disease. Uh, women at increased risk of cardiac disease, active systemic lupus, uh, or uh, active systemic lupus, and any undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. You always want to make sure you know why they're bleeding because you don't want to miss uh, a cancer or something like that. So everybody still hears and sees and everything. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> I didn't see any activity over there, so I didn't know if I was just talking to myself. Okay, so now the Nuva Ring, this is another combination uh, method, but it's delivered uh, in a soft silicone ring that's inserted into the vagina and it kind of goes around the cervix. Uh, it contains both estrogen and progesterone, so it has the same mechanism of action as the pill. It suppresses ovulation and thickens the mucus. One ring is inserted at the beginning of the cycle and left in place for three weeks and then removed for a one week break. This is when menses will occur. It can be removed for three hours without losing uh, efficacy. Some women like to remove it for intercourse. Um, it's about as effective as uh, oral contraceptive pills. It can be used along with tampons and it can be inserted into the vagina either manually or load it into an empty tampon inserter and put in that way. 
patch, you've got ortho ever or zulane transdermal patches. The transdermal patch is applied weekly for three weeks and then left off for a week. It again contains estrogen and progesterone, about the same efficacy. Uh, there is some loss of efficacy in obese women because of the um, decreased uh, absorption. A mechanism of action, uh, ovulation suppression, thickening of the mucus, and changes in the endometrial lining, which all of the combination methods do. Advantages are that it's convenient, it's once a week. Uh, benefits and risks are similar to the oral contraceptive pill, so is the NuvaRing. Uh, all of them contain the same hormones, so they're going to have the same uh, risks, same advantages, and same contraindications. Uh, one uh, Caution here is some people get uh, irritation at the site of the patch if they have a hard time using band-aids. If they break out when they use a band-aid because of uh, irritation, then they might have a hard time with this method. Uh, do you wear it one day each week? No, you wear it continuously. Uh, you change it once a week. You wear it continuously for three weeks and then you leave it off for a week. That would be like when you're taking the pill and you take the the one week of placebo or sugar pill. Uh, you t leave the patch off for a week and that's when you should have menses. They lose the patch for less than, if they lose it for less than 24 hours but cannot apply or lost the old patch, should they just apply a new one or keep the same? Uh, just apply a new one. If they can't get the old one to, to stick, just put a new one on. And just do the same time you know, keep it on for the same amount of time as you would the other one. So if it fell off on day three, you know, leave it on till day um, seven and then put a new one on. Extended use co uh, combination contraceptives, this delays or eliminates menstruation. These are getting very popular um, so that uh, a lot of uh, older women look at these and say, oh, you know, that's not healthy, never have a period. But the endometrium does not build up, so there's nothing to slough. So um, they've done lots of studies on these, and they have not found any decreased fertility later or any other problems with continuous use. Um, menstrual and non-menstrual benefits, such as decreased anemia because you're not having a menses, uh, decreased dysmenorrhea if you have, you know, terrible menstrual cramps, then this uh, helps, and decrease in premenstrual syndrome and depression. Uh, you may have some irregular breakthrough bleeding during the first several months. Uh, the lining of the uterus doesn't build up, so menses isn't needed. And some of the brands are Seasonal, Seasonique, and Librel, and there are others that are also uh, approved for uh, and at use. The transdermal patch and vaginal ring have been uh, used for extended use, you just don't take that one week break. It's off label right now, but a lot of doctors are doing that. So that's the combination methods. The, there are three different, there, all of those have estrogen and progesterone, so all of them have the same advantages and side effects and contraindications. Um, they're just different delivery systems, a patch, a ring, or a pill. Now we're gonna talk about progesterone only methods. There are several of these. There's the progesterone-only pills. There's Depo-Provera injection every three months. There's the inner uterine systems like the Marina and Kylina, which are every five, they can stay in for five years, or the Lolita or Skyla, which stay in for three years. And then there's the Nexplanon subdermal implant, which stays in for three years. The method of action of all the progesterone-only methods Again, they thicken cervical mucus to hopefully provide a barrier. The endometrial activity becomes out of sync, making implantation less likely. They have a negative effect on sperm motility, and some of them suppress ovulation. So the advantages for the progesterone-only methods is there's no estrogen. So it's okay for women that have contraindications to estrogen, such as smokers. Um, you know, somebody that has, um, uh, you know, breast cancer or has had a breast cancer, some, somebody that you don't want to take estrogen, uh, these methods are better. 
Um, they're preferred over the combination oral contraceptives, but use in caution with women that have uh, systemic lupus, migraines, hypertension, or coronary arteries, artery disease, and they can be used during breastfeeding. Some of the disadvantages for the progesterone only pills, they must be taken at the same time every day. A uh, delay of even a couple hours can result in contraceptive failure. So this is not a real good method for um, like a teenager <laughs> or somebody that you know is not able to remember to take them. It has to be you know somebody that's pretty motivated. And probably the most common uh, problem that women experience is irregular bleeding is very common with all the progesterone only methods. And that ranges from heavy bleeding to frequent spotting to amenorrhea. You know, and, and some women like amenorrhea, but some some don't. Some get upset, not knowing, you know, if they're not having a period every month, they then they worry that they're pregnant. So it causes them some, you know, anxiety. And so education about what to expect is very important. So uh, we have the the IUD, the uh, progesterone only IUD, the Marina, Skyla, Lolita, and Kylina. Uh, you don't need to know the dose. They release 20 micrograms of levo uh, or gesturel a day, and their du duration of use is from three to five years, depending on which one you choose. Again, they decrease menorrhagia. So these are uh, indicated for as a treatment for menorrhagia, even in the uh, absence of a need for contraception. Uh, they decrease dysmenorrhea and obviously anemia if you're not having heavy bleeding. And so they can be used to treat excessive vaginal bleeding. They decrease the risk of PID and ectopic pregnancy as compared to non-users of contraception. Okay, um, And they may be used by lactating women and those with contraindications to estrogen. Uh, some of the side effects, again, irregular bleeding, which can be heavy, uh, worse in the first few months. 20 to 25 percent will be amenorrheic at one year and will probably stay that way if they stay on this method. Uh, some women experience headache, uh, breast tenderness, and if they're prone to acne, then they may have flares of their acne because the progesterone is more likely to cause acne. Uh, expulsion is a, a risk with these, and it's more common in the first few cycles, and you need to teach a woman when one is inserted to check for the strings periodically. Uh, these are the little strings down here. It's almost like a soft, very fine fishing line or like propylene, if any of you uh, have sutured. <laughs> That's what it feels like and um, they should be able to feel those at the opening of the cervix. Um, contraindications, obviously pregnancy is a contraindication to any type of birth control. Uterine abnormalities that cause distortions, so maybe they have a bicornate uterus or something like that, the uh, IUD would not fit correctly in the uterus. Uh, acute PID or very high risk for PID an endometrial infection in the last three months, so maybe they just had PID last month, uterine, cervical, or breast cancer, undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. Again, you know, that's with every method of birth control. You need to find out what's causing their bleeding before you start giving them hormones, and acute mu mucopurulent cervicitis because that could be an STD. So you treat that first. So that's for the implant, I mean, not the implant, the IUD. Uh, Depo-Provera is uh, injectable progesterone that is given uh, intramuscularly every 12 weeks. The advantages are a decreased risk of ectopic pregnancy, decreased risk of endometrial cancer, and this one decreases the frequency of sickle cell crisis if you have a patient that has sickle cell. Um, it, improvement in endometriosis and it can be used immediately postpartum by breastfeeding moms. Some of the side effects and risks are a decrease in bone density, so you always want to recommend that they take calcium supplement and vitamin D while they're using um, Depo-Provera. That does seem to reverse itself pretty quickly once they stop using it. Uh, irregular or prolonged bleeding, especially in the first few months, 
but then again, 70% are amenorrheic by one year, and this is seen as a benefit by many. Possible weight gain, and this can be a lot of weight. So if they have a weight problem, then um, they need to, uh, you know, maybe try some oral progesterone-only methods that they could stop if they start gaining weight. It's kind of hard to do much about it if you give them an injection. It's going to last three months. So um, I've seen patients that, you know, didn't gain any weight, and I've seen patients that gained 20 and 30 pounds. So um, it, it's very variable. And then again, possible mood changes or depression. So if they're, you know, very um, susceptible to depression and they want to go on a progesterone-only method, try an oral one first that you can stop uh, instead of something long-term. See how it does. Okay, and here's the implant. It used to be called Implanon. I think those are pretty much all gone by now. Now it's called Nexplanon. It's a four centimeter flexible rod that's inserted in the up, upper arm under local anesthetic. You have to be trained to do it. It's not hard to do. It's almost like a, um, it's in a syringe with a, a large beveled needle. Um, and it's not difficult to do. I was trained to do it, but um, they had some problems years ago with the, um, there was another implant that had five rods and I can't remember the name of it now, but you didn't have to be trained to do those and people put them in and they put them in at weird angles and then, you know, if the patient gained weight or something, they couldn't find them and they couldn't get them out. <laughs> so um, the company that makes Nexplanon makes you go through a training session and they come back and watch you do it two or three times before you can get certified to do it and those are the only people that can order them so um, you may get to see some of your preceptors do this it contains just progesterone it is highly effective and it lasts for three years with less than one percent failure rate the um, the difference in it Nexplanon from Implanon was that they added a radio opaque strip so that they could find the, the, the implant because sometimes what happens is, you know, a patient gains a lot of weight over that three year period and um, this is inserted just under the skin. But um, if they gain a lot of weight, sometimes it's hard to find it. So um, it, they can take now the first one implanon did not have a radio opaque strip so you couldn't find it <laughs> so now you can uh, ACOG recently published a statement supporting the use of these in uh, teenagers and it may be less effective in overweight women they're not you know there's not like a, a certain weight that it says no you can't use it anymore but if you had a patient that's probably 300 pounds it's not going to be as effective uh, yes, Nexplanon is the one with the radio opaque strip. Uh, and Janice, Janessa said she's getting trained on how to place one next week with my peds and preceptor. Make sure that you um, talk to your, your Janessa, talk to your faculty facilitator about that, okay? And make sure she's going to, that you're allowed to do that. Uh, advantages for the next phenon, the same with all of the um, uh, progesterone only methods. It's convenient, it's reversible, it's long term, and it's highly effective. Uh, there's no estrogen, so again, it can be used by women with contraindications to estrogen and lactating mothers. It improves dysmenorrhea and heavy menses. The side effects are similar to the other progesterone only methods irregular bleeding, ranging from heavy bleeding to amenorrhea. Um, they may develop follicular cysts or ovarian cysts, but these usually resolve on their own. And it should be used in caution in women with uh, diabetes, depression, or hypertension. Some have fluid retention, so that can increase hypertension, uh, you know, if that's a problem. Uh, weight gain, again, is a problem, and so can increases in acne occur. So that's, those are similar with any of the progesterone-only methods. Um, hang on one, I'll get these questions in just a second. Let me finish this slide. And then this is the contraindications. It should not be used by women uh, with obviously known or a suspected pregnancy. 
um, or current or past history of thrombosis or thrombolytic disorders, liver tumors, benign or malignant, active liver dis disease, any abnormal vaginal bleeding, uh, breast cancer, um, history of breast cancer, um, progesterone sensitive cancers, or allergic component, uh, allergic to any of the components. Uh, let me go over and look at some questions. Bronte, is there any benefit of Nexplanon over the progesterone only IUD? Um, some women don't like the, the idea of an IUD. It can come out. Um, some find it uncomfortable. Some have uh, more uterine cramping when they have an IUD. So um, you don't have that with the Nexplanon. Um, but other than that, they're really, you know, they're about the same. They're both three years or one of the, a couple of the IUDs are five years. But, um, you know, it's really just personal preference. Uh, do you just go back and forth between arms every three years if the patient chooses to continue using Nexplanon. Now you can actually uh, insert it in the same region that you just took the, when you take one out, you can insert one right away. Uh, and then Sharon asked for the IUD contraindications, is it a history of uterine, cervical, or breast CA or current? Um, I would, as a nurse practitioner, I would be very leery to do any hormonal contraception in anyone with a history of or current uh, cancer of the breast, cervix, or uterus. I mean, you're giving them hormones, and it's just, you know, not that would be something for a physician to do. Um, most of these say, you know, not to be used in people that have a history of or current cancer. So I would not use any of these in those women because they are hormonal and you don't want to stimulate that. Maria asked, just guessing here, but used to, they said IUDs were not suggested for women who have never had a baby related to infertility, fallopian tube scar tissue caused by the IUD. So for nulliparous women, the next one on may be better. Actually, now they have taken away that, um, in that contraindication. They used to say that you didn't use IUDs in women that had not had a baby. Um, they do not say that anymore. Um, I think some of that may have been um, with early IUDs, you know, maybe they weren't screening well enough, you know, who, whether a patient should get an IUD. You shouldn't put an IUD in somebody that's at high risk for STDs or at high risk PID. Um, so the, the IUD itself does not cause any scarring in the tubes. PID causes scarring in the tubes. Um, putting an IUD in before screening somebody for an STD um, and putting it into a, a uterus that has bacteria into it, that will cause you know, problems. But, you know, screening them for STD, making sure that they don't have one, treating them if they do, and then making sure, you know, that everything comes back negative, and then putting an IUD in is not going to cause a problem. Um, so it, it shouldn't cause scarring of the tubes. Uh, let's see. Really asked, they call the Skyla and Kalina the little sister of Marina, one si uh, smaller in size, the other lower dose, and a smaller size makes it more useful for nulliparous. Yeah, I did see the Kalina uh, ad on TV today, uh, twice. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but and it is the smallest um, IUD available. So um, insertion might be a little more comfortable. Um, ex, uh, being expelled might be a little less likely. Um, uh, and then the Skyla does have less um, hormones than the other ones. So it's kind of like the mini pill or you know, the low dose birth control pills. I think I've answered all the questions. That, okay, so we've gone through uh, the combination oral contraceptives uh, and the ring and the patch, those are all the combination methods. We've gone through the progesterone only methods, which are the, um, the implant, the IUDs, the pills, and the injections. And now we're going to talk about barrier methods. Um, these are used during intercourse to keep sperm from traveling through the cervix to the uterus. We have diaphragm. Um, Many of you probably will never see a diaphragm, uh, never fit a diaphragm. I think they've kind of gone out of fashion, but you know they are a non, uh, 
hormonal method. So um, they are um, preferable to some women that don't want to have any exogenous hormones or anything. Uh, oh, your group, Amanda says her group fitted them at intensives. That's interesting. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you know, they do have to be fitted. We'll, we'll talk about those in a minute. And then you have, you know, creams and jellies and condoms. So obviously condoms, you have male and female condoms. Female condoms are not quite, you know, not near as uh, common as the male condoms. Um, you have sponges, um, a, fem, a fem cap, which is a cervical cap, and then a diaphragm. And all of these are barrier methods. Male condom, 15% failure rate with typical use, uh, contraceptive use. The, uh, it's used for both contraception and sexually transmitted infection prevention um, mechanism of action. Pretty simple. It's a physical barrier. Appropriate use, you want to make sure that they don't um, use any oil-based lubricants, Vaseline or anything like that, petroleum-based, because that will um, cause disintegration of the latex, um, and that they want to apply it before any vaginal uh, penetration and um, know how to correctly apply it and remove it. <laughs> um, avoid spermicidal condoms because there is a risk of genital ulceration and possible increase in uh, female UTIs with those. And condoms, again, should always be encouraged for sexually active clients at risk for STDs in conjunction with their other methods. Female condom, uh, 5 to 21% failure rate. Again, it's a barrier to the sperm. It's both for contraception and STD prevention, and it's important to remove it before standing up to avoid contact with the sperm. And um, these are over-the-counter, as are male condoms. Actually never seen one. Uh, diaphragm we were talking about. This is a little rubber cap that goes covers completely covers the cervix and provides a barrier. 6 to 16 percent failure rate. Uh, it's contraceptive and there is some evidence that it may protect, provide some protection from cervical HPV by providing a barrier. Um, it's um, best, uh, the best efficacy is if it's used with spermicide in the cup. Uh, that's put in the cup before it's put in. Uh, it's by prescription and has to be fitted and has to be refitted again if the patient loses a lot of weight or gains a lot of weight or after a pregnancy. And it can be left uh, in for six to eight hours after intercourse. Uh, the vaginal sponge, these are over the counter. Uh, the uh, failure rate is about 13 to 16%. They again provide a barrier and they are impregnated with spermicide and they're good for 24 hours and you must leave this one in place for six hours after uh, intercourse for it to be effective. And then the FemCap um, is, again, another barrier. It has to be fitted. It's by prescription only, and it's just smaller than the um, diaphragm. And then chemical con uh, contraception. Uh, are they supposed to leave them in purposely, or is it more correct to say that they must be left in. Um, the diaphragm and the, the um, femcap, yes, they need to be left in for a while because the uh, spermicide needs to be able to work. If you take it out right away and you still have sperm in the vagina that's alive, it can go up into the uterus. So yeah, they need to leave them in for a few hours. Um, uh, chemical uh, contraception, jellies, creams, foam, vaginal suppositories, vaginal contraceptive film, and it's also found in sponges and in some condoms. These are all over the counter. Uh, Ninoxidol 9 is the main ingredient. Uh, 18 to 29% failure rate. The mechanism of action is to destroy uh, sperm. It's inserted 15 minutes before intercourse, and you can wait up to one to three hours maximum before intercourse. And some people do have sensitivity reactions to these. Um, I was saying like the uh, spermicide that's in the some of the condoms can cause um, ulceration of the penis. So that's not a whole lot of fun. And some women 
uh, have allergic reactions to the spermicide. And then surgical approaches, uh, uh, vasectomy, uh, there's a conventional method with a scrotal incision, and they interrupt the vas deferens through the incision, and then a non-scalpel uh, method, which is used as a, just a puncture of the scrotum, and the vas deferens is either crushed or ligated. 0.15% um, failure rate, so it is very effective. Obviously, it block sperm from entering the ejaculate. Uh, it should be considered permanent, although reversals can be done. Uh, you don't want them going into it thinking that it's going to be reversed. Um, it's not considered completed until they have a post-procedure semen analysis, which shows no sperm, and it can usually be done in the office or outpatient center. Female sterilization, uh, there are different methods of tubal ligation, tubal cauterization. I don't, I'm going to probably have to update this slide because I don't know if they're doing Ensure, Esure anymore. These were little, um, almost like a spring that went into the fallopian tubes, and I'm not sure if they're even using those anymore, and then clips. But these would all be done by the physician, not, not you. <laughs> Female sterilization, highly effective. Um, there's a little bit higher failure rate with the clip. Uh, it creates a barrier to the fallopian tube. It should be considered permanent, although reversals have been done, and it's done in a hospital or surgery center. And then just talk real quickly about some other methods that are non-hormonal. So uh, the most common one that you'll probably uh, talk about is the uh, copper IUD or the Paragard. Uh, this has got very, very fine copper wire wrapped around the plastic T. So it's similar in size to the Marina or progesterone IUD, but there is no, um, no hormone in it. Efficacy is less than 1% failure rate. It, the mechanism of action is that the copper reduces sperm motility and overdevelopment. It prevents fertilization. It does not act as a abortificant, so it doesn't act to um, you know, abort a, a fetus. Uh, there are no hormones. It's reliable for up to 10 years. It can be inserted any time in the cycle as long as you're sure the patient isn't pregnant, so you do a pregnancy test. But it's usually done in the first five days of the cycle. That's the same with all the IUDs, um, mainly because the cervix is a little more open during that time, so insertion is a little less painful. Um, you do have to use a, a little sound or a dilator to open the cervix, and uh, if it's done right after the period, it's a little easier to do. I did not like inserting IUDs. I've done them many times, but I just, not, I always freak out. <laughs> um, it can be placed immediately post-delivery, um, and there is a little higher risk of expulsion if they do that, or you can wait until the second month postpartum. It can be used by breastfeeding moms. It's rapidly reversible. You take it out, your fertility is restored because there are no hormones. And ACOG uh, recently supported use in sexually active teens due to the high uh, effectiveness and low failure rates, same as with the, the progesterone uh, in, uh, the progesterone implant and the progesterone IUD. Uh, ACOG um, is supporting long-term contraceptive methods for teens. Um, the copper IUD is also approved as emergency contraception. It's inserted within seven days of unprotected sex, and it interferes with sperm function and implantation. I, copper isn't an abortifacient. Why do they use it post-rape in the ER? Okay, so this is right here, and, and you know, that's an ethical decision for the patient and the provider to discuss. Um, it, you, you, if you have an intrauterine pregnancy and you put this in, I mean, you wouldn't do that. I mean, you wouldn't do it as a method of abortion, um, but you can use it as a method of emergency contraception because um, it interferes with the sperm function and with the implantation. So, you know, contraception does, I mean, conception doesn't always occur, you know, 10 minutes after you have sex. 
I mean, the sperm can live in the body for about 48 hours. The ova can live for several, you know, I'm not sure how many hours, but they meet up in the fallopian tube at some point, and it might not be the day that you had intercourse. So if you insert this immediately after a rape, it hopefully will interfere with sperm function and then implantation. Now, you know, implantation is implantation of a fertilized egg. So where you go with that one is going to be up to, <laughs> up to everybody's individual moral compass. Um, but it, it, you know, because it is a foreign body in the uterus, it's going to interfere with implantation of that um, ovum in the uterus. Does that make sense? Okay. And Ashley is saying you bleed more with the copper IUD because there is no hormone suppression. Yes, that is correct. Um, would they be good uh, for those with the contraindications previously mentioned? Yes. So let's talk about that a little bit. So the side effects, slightly heavier menses and slightly more dysmenorrhea, especially at the beginning. So this isn't a method you want to use in somebody that is suffering from, you know, severe dysmenorrhea or severe uh, menorrhagia. You want to use a uh, progesterone method in that to slow all that down. But, you know, in somebody that has normal or light periods uh, and doesn't have very many cramps, it's a good method. Uh, increased risk of PID is usually associated with insertion. That's what I talked about before. Um, and that would be the same for the other, uh, the, the progesterone. If you are not using aseptic technique, if you're not um, screening them for STDs before insertion, then obviously you can push bacteria up into the uterus and cause PID. Um, increased risk of ectopic pregnancy, but the risk is still lower than women not using any contraception. So there is a slightly increased risk of ectopic pregnancy, but compared to women that don't use any contraception, it's lower. Uh, expulsion of the IUD, and this is most common in the first cycle with all IUDs. Perforation of the uterus, and this uh, can occur during insertion, and that again can occur with any IUD. And risk to the fetus if pregnancy develops uh, when the device is in place. And again, that's the same with progesterone or copper IUD. If a pregnancy develops, um, you know, it puts both the fetus and the mother at risk. Contraindications, obviously, pregnancy. Uh, uterine abnormalities, same as with the, the uh, progesterone one, if they have a, a oddly shaped uterus or bicornet uterus or something like that, acute PID or high risk for PID, endometrial infection in the last three months, uterine or cervical cancer, undiagnosed vaginal bleeding, uh, acute mucopurulent cervicitis. You know, you got to check all these things out first, make sure, you know, that they get cleared up and treated before you do any of this. Wilson's disease, anybody know what that is? What's it from? Not iron. What's in this IUD? Copper, okay? And they can't metabolize the copper storage. So uh, if they have Wilson's disease, you don't want to use this. And then obviously allergy to any component. Uh, you do see it in the eyes. There's, uh, there's little either ring or little specks. I can't remember. I haven't uh, looked that up in a while. But if you look, in, look up Wilson's disease, um, it will tell you what the finding is in the eyes. Uh, any questions about the copper IUD? Um, copper IUD fertility remains returns immediately, same as with Marina. Well, the copper IUD, yes, it returns immediately because there are no uh, hormones. The Marina uh, may not be immediate because remember you have been, you've had something in your body that's been secreting hormones. So um, it is pretty quickly after the marina, um, quicker than like depo provera. I mean, if you decide, you know, two weeks after you get a depo provera shot that you want to get pregnant, you know, depo provera stays in your body for about four or five months. So <laughs> you're not going to get pregnant right away. Um, but with the other, the, the marine, you know, the uh, progesterone IUDs, once you take them out, the levels drop pretty quickly. So ret fertility returns pretty quickly. 
but with the copper, there is no um, no hormone at all, so it's pretty immediate. Um, do they need to test for Wilson's disease before putting them in? No. Um, no if you, if uh, I would have to, I'll try to look on the internet tonight and find a picture or find a little bit about Wilson's disease and put it in the forum, but um, that would be something that the patient probably would know about. Um, but no, you wouldn't screen everybody because it's pretty rare. Any other questions about um, any of the methods we've gone through so far? Lactational amenorrhea method. This is basically breastfeeding um, to prevent uh, ovulation. Uh, efficacy is a very low failure rate, only 2%, and the mechanism is ovarian suppression. Uh, it can be used in the first <clears throat> six months postpartum, but only if you are exclusively breastfeeding with no supplementation, um, and only as long as they are amenorrhea. So if uh, a woman has a baby and, you know, by the third month she's breastfeeding but her period comes back, she cannot rely on this method any longer when she's starting to ovulate again. But ovulation, I mean, um, breastfeeding, especially breastfeeding, uh, only breastfeeding with no supplementation should cause your um, hormone levels to, to um, ovulating. So natural family planning, uh, there are several different methods of this. We're not going to go over a lot of this, but um, failure rate is kind of high, 13 to 20 percent, depending on the number of uh, methods that they use. They can use several different methods to make it a little more um, effective. The mechanism of action is to try to pinpoint the fertile period and abstain from intercourse during these times. And there are different ways to monitor fertility, the basal body temperature charts, uh, cervical mucus tracking, menstrual calendars, cervical position tracking. Um, they can use several of these methods together to, to make the um, methods a little more effective. And this is acceptable for certain religious groups who forbid formal con contraception and for women that just, you know, want natural methods and don't want to uh, use any drugs. Uh, withdrawal or coitus interruptives, obviously not very effective, up to 27% failure rate. Its uh, mechanism that of action is to prevent contact between the sperm and ova, so withdrawal before ejaculation. Um, but some studies indicate that sperm are present in the pre-ejaculate fluid, so um, it's you know, not very, <laughs> not a good method. It should be used, uh, it's often used in conjunction with fertility awareness methods, uh, the ones that we just talked about, and obviously it's male partner dependent. Uh, emergency contraception, so let's talk about this a little bit. So emergency contraception is uh, any type of um, medication that you're gonna give or um, a Paragard IUD um, to try to avoid pregnancy in someone that has had a, either a contraceptive failure or they've had um, intercourse when they weren't planning to, either you know an assault or maybe they just you know went away for a weekend and met somebody and <laughs> so uh, for whatever reason they did not use a contraceptive method and they do not want to get pregnant. So emergency contraception is available. Uh, the risk of pregnancy is from one to 4% depending on when they take the, the um, emergency contraception. The method of action is that it prevents ovulation and thickens cervical mucus and it may inhibit implantation. Uh, again, it is not an abortificant in that if you have an implanted ovum in the uterine lining. If you are pregnant, it is not going to disrupt that pregnancy. You can take all the progesterone in the world, and it's not going to stop that pregnancy. Um, you know, again, the whole does conception start at the moment the egg and the sperm meet in the fallopian tube, and is is disrupting implantation and abortificant. That's 
for you and your spiritual uh, advisor <laughs> to decide. But, you know, as a healthcare professional, you know, we just want to give them the facts and let them make their own uh, judgments about what to use. Um, the only contraindication to emergency contraception is known pregnancy. And if they already know that they're you know, six weeks pregnant, then it's not going to do any good. But other than that, all the other contraindications, you know, having, um, you know, a smoker or anything like that, those all go out the window because it's a one-time uh, medication, so you can give it to anybody. And the risks for <clears throat> um, any of the risks of these are much less than the risks for a full-term pregnancy. So is the definition of a fortificant disruption of the ova already implanted? I, Allison's asking that. I think that's what they use in the literature as a fortificant. Um, you know, like if you used, what is it, are you six or something? I or, uh, the you know there are there's that drug that they can use to to cause you to have a miscarriage. Um, you know that's an abortificant. But um, obviously some of these methods interfere with implantation. So. You know, but they do not call those abortificants. So, you know, there is a kind of a um, gray line there. Um, the two different methods for emergency contraception are progesterone only pills. This is like plan B, next choice. There are a few different names, uh, plan B one step. Uh, I think one of them is called my way. And most of these, uh, they are all levogestrinol and the plan B, Next choice, I don't even know if they're making this anymore. It was 70.75 milligrams uh, Q12 hours times two doses. So they took one now and one 12 hours later. But in the package, they said they could take them together. Then plan B one step, which is probably all you would see at the pharmacy now, is both tablets at once, 1.5 milligrams uh, PO one time. It's most effective when taken as soon as possible after unprotected sex. It's approved for up to 72 hours, but some studies show that it can be effective up to five days after unprotected sex. Uh, method of action is if um, ovulation hasn't occurred yet, it can delay or inhibit ovulation. It can alter tubal transport of the sperm or inhibit implantation. It is not effective once the process of implantation has started and will not harm an existing pregnancy. So if a woman is a few weeks, you know, four or five weeks pregnant, um, it's not going to cause her to lose, you know, have a miscarriage. Um, side effects, a nausea is probably the most common side effect. Um, abdominal pain, spotting, changes in the menstrual cycle, you know, you know what day you were on, it may come sooner, it may come later. Um, because you're given a big bunch of you know, big dose of hormones uh, at one time. It is available over the counter for any age with no ID and no prescription needed. A lot of pharmacies do keep it behind the counter, which is intimidating to some teenagers, but it is available. Contraindication is um, pregnancy category X. Obviously, you don't want to give it to a pregnant patient, but it will not harm a pregnancy. It's not intended <laughs> to give be given to a pregnant patient but it's not going to harm it. And then the second one is a prescription. It's called Ella, and it's a progesterone antagonist, and ag agonist antagonist. It's one 30 milligram tablet that's taken as soon as possible after unprotected sex, but up to five days uh, after. It uh, delays ovulation and inhibits implantation. Side effects are similar, headache, nausea, abdominal pain, and menstrual changes. This one is available only by prescription. There are no age limits, but it has to be prescribed by a provider. And again, that's uh, category X for pregnancy. And they do, this one is relatively new, about five years old, and they don't know the effects of pre on pregnancy. So you don't want to give that if they are pregnant. Copper IUD, a Paragard can be used uh, as emergency contraception. The progesterone, uh, IUD cannot be used, uh, you know, like the Marina or the Skyla, those are not approved for emergency contraception, just the copper IUD. Insertion of the Paragard within seven days of unprotected sex. Um, 
the method of action is to interfere with sperm function and inhibit implantation. Uh, you can see the side effects on the IUD slide. And again, it must be inserted by a trained provider and the contraindications you can see on the IUD slide. And then combination oral contraceptive pills, just a pack of pills. We used to do this all the time at the health department. Many of the brands of combination oral contraceptives can be used for emergency contraception. Um, you can refer to any drug reference book and they will give you, you know, some of them, it's like eight tablets or something like that that you have to take. Side effects, you can look at the oral contraceptive, the, um, the slide for combination oral contraceptives to see what the side effects big one's going to be nausea, uh, and contraindications uh, are none except known pregnancy. Um, but uh, we used to do that a lot at the health department. So. But now with plan B, next step, you know, or one step, it's so much easier just to do that. Methods of STI uh, protection, male and female condom, cervical barrier devices, um, dental dams for oral sexual activity, and again, you always want to encourage use of, of uh, STD protection, regardless of what method of country. And then patient follow-up. Uh, you want to schedule follow-up depending on the method used. You want to recheck the placement of IUDs in four to six weeks and then follow them yearly and tell them, obviously, to check the strings, usually uh, about once a month. You want to follow up with pills, patches, and rings in three months and then every year. Depo injections are given every 12 weeks, so you're going to see them in the office uh, every three months. And you want to ask, are you using the method consistently and correctly? Are you having any side effects? Do you have any new health conditions? You know, have you all of a sudden been diagnosed with high blood pressure or something? And are you satisfied with it? You know, if they're not satisfied with it, they're not going to continue to use it. So it's important to, you know, make sure that they know that there are other methods available and, and you know, maybe that one's not the one that they need and uh, talk to them about other ones. I know that's a lot of information and I'm sorry for all the technical issues at the beginning, but um, any questions on anything on contraception? Are there any complications for someone with an IUD to have a pap smear? No. Um, you can you do pap smear just as you would anybody else. Um, you do want to be gentle if you're using that, um, not the broom as much. With the liquid prep, uh, if you watched the PowerPoint or the big blue button from the other day, the liquid prep has a really soft silicone broom. They call it a broom. It's kind of um, a little bit wider that you go around the cervix um, and the center. Uh, bristles, they're not bristles because they're soft, but those are a little longer and they're supposed to kind of go in the in the endocervical canal to collect things. Um, those are pretty soft and probably wouldn't mess with the strings at all. If you use the, the broom, the one that's actually little bristles uh, that goes up into the endocervical canal, you just want to be careful that you don't like, you know, stick it in the canal with the strings hanging out and then twist a bunch and yank because you could twist the, you know, you don't want to get the strings of the IUD entangled in that brush and then pull the IUD out. So that would not be good. But uh, I've done lots of uh, pap smears on people with IUDs and never had a problem with it. And IUDs are pretty easy to pull out. You just get spring forceps and or hemostat and grab the strings and Doug, when it comes right out. So, any other questions? Uh, is it possible that in the future can you supply the slides as PowerPoint and not PDF? Um, PowerPoint is much easier to print several slides. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot to do that. Um, if you remind me next time, well, this is, yeah, we've got one more. I'll, somebody put something in the form right before the one next Monday, and I'll uh, remember to do that. I'll put it as a regular PowerPoint so that you can print it three slides per page or however you want to. And then I'll, you know, I have to do it as a PDF to upload it into this program for Big Blue Button, but I, I do have the, the regular one too because I keep that for editing. Any other questions? Are you getting through? Um, can you 
convert easily to PowerPoint. And I convert what to PowerPoint? Change your PDFs to PowerPoint. Oh, just save them and click on PowerPoint. Okay, someone's saying you can do that yourself. Um, okay, Venus asked, to Cherney, page 943, contraceptives in older women, special considerations in this age group include the frequency of menstrual irregularity, sexual problems, and the probability, possibility of menstrual men, menopausal symptoms, all of which respond to hormonal methods. Which oral contraceptives are best for uh, older women to alleviate these types of symptoms? I think I don't have my book, you know, it's over, <laughs> over there, so I'm not going to run over there and get it. But I think they're probably talking about women in the perimenopause. Um, you have, you know, you have menopause isn't a button. It's not, you know, you turn 50 and everything shuts down, you know, on your birthday. It'd be nice if it did. But um, you do have a time period, usually in your late 40s, called the perimenopause, where your periods will become irregular. They may become very heavy. Um, they, you may have a lot more bleeding, a lot more cramping, or you may just start skipping periods. It, it's variable and, and can change as time goes on. But, you know, if you're still having periods, you could conceivably still get pregnant. So yes, you do want to have some method of contraception, but also to alleviate some of those symptoms as they're heading into perimenopause, their estrogen's decreasing, they may be having you know, the heavy bleeding or, or something like that and hot flashes. So if they do not have other contraindications, like they smoke or have diabetes or high blood pressure, then you can use hormonal, um, you know, any of a low dose oral contraceptive, uh, combination oral contraceptive for women to help them through that period. Uh, it will decrease their bleeding if they're having a lot of bleeding. Um, it will help with some of the hot flashes. So some women do do that, but you usually use uh, one of the lower, you know, one of the low dose methods. <clears throat> and then if they're having menorrhagia, you can use the uh, progesterone IUD. And uh, even if they don't need, uh, just say they've had their tubes tied, but now they're, you know, 48 and having menorrhagia, you can use the uh, progesterone. Any other questions? Overwhelmed. Okay, don't worry about the, uh, Venus says she's overwhelmed with the number of uh, combination oral contraceptive choices. Don't worry about that. When you talk to your preceptors, when you go in there, they will most likely say that they have three or four go-tos. I mean, I it's been seven, six, six or seven years, I can't remember. I, I moved here in 2011. Before that, I was working in the birth, in, in the um, health department. I was doing a lot of women's health. And it was orthonovum 777 or orthotricycline. And, you know, you just get comfortable with, and a lot of it for us was they were getting free contraception because it was a health department and most of them didn't have any money. So it was what we had. But um, just like with antibiotics, you will get familiar with a few uh, brands in each category, and those are the ones they'll use. Um, usually, you kind of start them out on a, like a tricyclic or some, uh, a, you know, or the tricycline or something like that. And then, if they have problems, that PowerPoint that I gave you on starting contra uh, oral contraceptives has some different things that you can do. You know, if they're having, you know, breakthrough bleeding, and depending on when it is, at the beginning or in the second half, you can um, tweak what medication you're giving them with either a higher dose or a lower dose of one of the hormones. So um, that's something to talk with your preceptor about because, you know, they can um, help you understand that. But you don't need to memorize all the, uh, you know, different oral contraceptive pills. You know, what I want you to know is the classes, the oral, con you know, the, um, I'm really asked, does the health department carry Plan B? When I was there, it was seven years ago, Plan B was just coming out. We had the, we would just give them eight uh, low oval, <laughs> which was a combination pill back then. But um, uh, I can't remember. I, we may have had 
progesterone that we gave. I can't, you know, it's been seven years, so I can't really remember, but it was coming out over the counter at the time. So we would usually refer them to go get it at the pharmacy. <clears throat> but, you know, as far as don't worry too much about the names of the pills or anything, you know, I want you to know combination oral contraceptives, you know, the COCs. I want you to know the progesterone methods, you know, whether they be the pill, the patch, I mean, the pill, the uh, injection, the implant, or the IUD, the other combination methods, the, the ring and the patch, um, and then know the uh, side effects, the uh, indications, you know, the advantages, and the contraindications for that class. Once you know it for that class, you don't have to really worry about individual things because it's, you know, it's the same drug, so it's going to be the same uh, uh, contraindications and advantages for each of those. Um, and then uh, the barrier methods and the non-hormonal methods. Love your cabinets. <laughs> Can't tell what's behind me, how, but um, I have a decorator coming tomorrow, so I might have different cabinets will be the same, but I can't wait. <laughs> I'm finally going to get rid of some of my builder beige. I've been here for six years and need to make the house my own. <laughs> so, Okay, well, if there's no other questions, I'm going to go ahead and sign off, and uh, we will have um, a third big blue button on the STD um, case studies, and we'll do that on Monday. And hopefully everybody stay warm and safe and drive safe. Don't drive if you don't have to, <laughs> if you're in any, almost anywhere in the country right now, it's having bad weather. So, okay, good night.